so just give me something with diamonds. <laughs> so I gave her a pack of playing cards. <laughs> That's actually not true for any of it. <laughs> I knew that I was getting older when I went to an antique auction and three people pinned on me. <laughs> chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, I'm sure you won't know this scripture, trust the Lord with, Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Dear, we thank you for the word that you gave us, and for the opportunity for us to share it together this morning, and I just pray that you'll direct it to where it needs to go and then accomplish what you wanted to accomplish this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So Abraham, and he was, his name was Abram to start with, but this, the following is one of Abram's, or Abraham's follies. His um, union with Hagar was another one, <clears throat> but that's another story also. The same thing happened that we're going to talk about today. Again, when in chapter 9, Abraham told Abimelech the same exact thing that Sarah was his sister. And that I think of as Abram's or Abraham's folly. Abram had trusted God when God called him to go out of his homeland. He trusted God when he was about to go into a land that was that he knew nothing about. He was he was 75 years old at the time. Imagine going into the unknown, and he didn't know about the culture, about the people, about their cities, about their military. He didn't know what to expect. He didn't know anything about their culture. He probably didn't know their language, although he was able to communicate with them. But he did have the promise of God. He had a promise, and he believed the promise. Genesis 12, 2 and 3, it said, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you will I curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So this is the first time we see Abraham's faith when he believed God, and he went out into the unknown with his entourage, with his nephew, and we pick it up then in verse number 10 of Genesis chapter 12, which says, Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. <clears throat> so observe here that Abram went to Egypt because of a famine, um, a severe famine, it says. Probably the famine was life-threatening. The livestock would starve. Um, Abram wasn't, um, he wasn't a planter and harvester. He was a herdsman. And so if the livestock couldn't find fodder, they would starve. And as the livestock goes, there goes also the nomadic herders, which Abram was once. So what did he do? He panicked. Now, he had gone there because he believed God, and that's where God told him to go, but he panicked, and here he's going to go and do something of his own mind and his own choosing. So as the owner of all the livestock, and that was what his wealth was in at this time, he was probably pressured to do something. His wife, Sarai was her name at that time, and all who were with him were probably pressuring him. Do something. We're going to perish if we stay in this place. Pressure. A lot of pressure on him. Do something. you got to do something. Observe also that God did not instruct him to go to Egypt. His instructions were go, to go into the land he would be shown, which was the land of Canaan. So, his, his instruction was out of God's will at this point. He was outside of God's uh, instructions and out of God's will. To hear clearly from God 
and to do something else of our own determination is folly for the believer. Can you get an amen? amen. But we do it. <laughs> but we do it. Our clearest instruction comes from God's Word. Amen? Amen. Everything you hear in your spirit must agree with the Word. The spirit always goes the way of the Word. When we get our own idea and get ahead of God, things don't go as well as they should. Sometimes we fail because of that. And here's the folly. Verse 11. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. She was probably, uh, I think, 10 years younger than him. She was 65 at this time. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but let you live. Say, you are my sister, so that I'll be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. Now here is a selfish attitude on Abram's part, as he was known at that time. I don't know what they'll do to you, Sarai, but at least they won't kill me. That's what he's saying. <laughs> what a terrible attitude. I don't know how it's going to go with you, but they won't kill me if you say you're my sister. So she must have been a gorgeous woman. And maybe the Egyptian women were plain by comparison, or not as gorgeous as Sarai. But otherwise, why would Abraham fear that the Egyptians would take her? Were they known for doing such things as that? I don't know. But Abraham thought of Sarai, his wife, as the most beautiful woman, and she was 10 years younger than he was. The world is full of beautiful women. And each man should think of his wife as the most beautiful woman on the planet. I think of my wife that way. I really do. I really do. It's like having blinders, and that's a good thing. Verse 14, when Abram went, uh, came to Egypt, the Egyptians, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. Verse 15, and when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. So I don't know what kind of, how that taken, I don't have, you know, you can get different pictures out. Did they capture her? Was she dragged away screaming? Did they, I, I, don't, I don't know how that happened. And it doesn't say, it just says she was taken into his palace because, uh, because she, uh, his officials noticed how beautiful she was and she took him to the palace as Abraham had thought she would. So verse 16, he treated Abram well for her sake. And Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. So they took his wife and gave him all this stuff. There, you know, there's something a little unsettling about that to me. It's not just, it just didn't happen. He's, he's okay, but she's captive. And he's uh, profiting from that. So this must have been going on for a while. Sheep, cattle, donkeys, servants, you know, I can't imagine all those things came to him just immediately. <clears throat> By this time, Abram must have felt pretty good about himself. He must have thought that he was pretty smart. Going down to Egypt, his wealth is increasing. He didn't get killed because of Sarai, which he was afraid would happen. And all is well, or maybe not. Verse 17, but the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarah. So God had to intervene because Abram, first of all, he shouldn't have been there. He never should have been there in the first place. He should have stayed, stayed in Canaan and God would have sustained him there because that's where he was supposed to be. We do that. 
We go into things that we're not supposed to go into because God doesn't direct us to go into them. And we get in trouble doing that. So in verse 18, so Pharaoh summoned Abram, what have you done to me, he said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here's your wife, take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders that Abram had it, about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. So he got kicked out of Egypt. The Pharaoh said, get out of here, take your wife and go. This disease that came in my household is because you lied to me and I brought her here to be my wife. So first of all, number one, Abraham knew God. Abraham knew God. God had talked to him. We, we can know God on that level that Abraham knew God on. With, with, um, you know, with Adam and with Noah, with Abram, with the prophets, God initiated the conversation, even with Moses. God chose those uh, whom he would communicate with, usually with instructions, like Moses at the burning bush. We can have intimate conversations with God, and we should, but before the crucifixion, God would only be approached by the priest. This is after Moses, after Leviticus. God's presence was only manifested in the Holy of Holies unless he decided to initiate his presence with someone. Only the high priest could go uh, into the Holy of Holies behind the curtain only once a year and only with blood. Once the perfect sacrifice was made on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the curtain of the Holy of Holies was torn in two. And now we don't need a priest to go in there for us to make sacrifices for us. We can go directly to God. There's no curtain between us and God. The only thing we have to do is to go to him through Jesus and our faith in him. So once we come to him in faith and repentance, once we get saved, the Holy Spirit abides within us, and we can and we should communicate with God anytime and all the time. Allow God to join in the conversation. Sometimes we get down before God, we rattle off a list of things we wanted to do, and then we say, okay, Lord, I'll see you. We don't give him a chance to speak with a still small voice into our spirit, things that he wants us to do. It's one-sided if we just make a list of things we want God to do, right? But we tend to do that. Number two, Abraham had, Abraham had direct communication with God about what he was going to do, what, that is what God was gonna do. The instructions were specific. It was God's will that Abraham's descendants would live in the land of Canaan. The Messiah would come from there. The land would be given to the descendants of, of Abram. Uh, David would rule there. And God had a plan, a big plan for Abraham. But Abraham thought that he had a better plan. There's a famine here. I got to go somewhere else. Did you ever have a famine in your spiritual walk and you got to go somewhere else instead of just waiting on God? Did you ever have that? It happens. How much we could accomplish for God if we would just follow his instructions and wait and not allow our own concerns to pull us away from God's will. It's when we get a better idea or ignore what God is trying to tell us, that things don't go well. We get a better idea. Lord, I, you know, I, I'm going to do it this way instead of what you told me, because nothing's happening. So I'm going to get an idea and do it my own way. That doesn't go well. Number three, Abraham sinned when he lied. 
even though Sarai was his half-sister, so it was true that, she, that he could call her a sister, but he told a half-truth, and a half-truth is a lie. Not only that, but he encouraged Sarai to communicate a deception. She was part of it. There is no little white lie. A lie is a lie. 1 John 3, 18, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. The truth has to ring. You can't be lying. John 8, 31 and 32. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold my teaching, you are really my disciples, verse 32. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So the truth is important. Not to lie, not little lies, not big lies, not any lies, not deceptions or part truths. So apparently Abram thought that this untruth or deception would keep him free, would keep him alive. In fear, he resorted to an untruth, he resorted to a deception. In addition to that, he encouraged Sarai to participate in the lie, in the deception. Number four, God will have his way. God inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household. So how did Pharaoh know where the disease came from? Well, the only thing new in the house was the addition of this woman. So maybe Sarah told Pharaoh then that she was Abram's wife, because he seems to have known that. And I don't think that fact would bother Pharaoh except for the disease that God sent to his household. And he said, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? So she must have told him that when everybody was getting sick. I think Sarai might have had more sense than Abram. <laughs> it would seem that she did. Number five, God does intervene. Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Do we live on our own plans, our own purposes, our own desires, do we? Do we try to discover what God's plan is for us? That's a good question. It wasn't my plan to be a minister. I didn't want anything to do with it. My own thoughts were in a different direction. God had to turn me around. I thought that when I retired, I would have a clock shop, and I would repair clocks and sell them, and buy old ones, antique ones. I can repair clocks a little bit, but I only know enough about the clocks just to be dangerous. <laughs> I must have 20 clocks in various stages of disrepair of my house, and sometimes I can get them working, and sometimes I can't, and I repaired a few clocks for people. I uh, repaired one for Scotty, and it's not working. <laughs> it was working when I repaired it. It worked twice a day. Twice a day, it's a perfect time. So that was my, my thing. I keep my building, I don't have a clock repairing station in there. It would have been a disaster if I'd have done that. Just like this disaster. But God had a better idea. <coughs> better than my idea. I wasn't going to be a minister. It wasn't my, that wasn't my way. It wasn't my thought. But can God turn you around? I was 65 when I accepted that. 65 when I started studying for ministry. I thought, this can't happen. And then I, I got the credential and I started filling in and I was interim pastoring here and there. And I thought that would be my life. I said, I'm too old. No church has ever been asked me to be the pastor. <laughs> And I was glad when that happened, but I never thought that would happen. You know, we've all experienced God's hand, God's hand of intervention. Healing is intervention. We asked God this morning for intervention. We prayed for that. We prayed for intervention, and we had four people in the hospital with COVID. We're praying for intervention 
on Carol's behalf right now. Like God does intervene. Not just when we do something stupid like Abraham did, but he intervened. <laughs> but we have to bring our thoughts, this is point number six, and desires into alignment with God's will. It's hard to do if you don't know what his will is. And sometimes it's hard to, to know that. It is will for you is revealed by the still small voice in your spirit. And it's verified by the word. The spirit always goes the way of the word. That's why we need to be in the Bible every day. We need to be in the word and know the word every day. God speaks to us through his word. When I was resisting being a minister, I had three objections. I don't, I don't even remember what they were. I said, Lord, I can't do this because of us and such. And I, I read a, a one-year Bible. If you, know, if you know what that is. Every day there's a Old Testament, New Testament, Psalm, and Proverb, and it goes through the Bible. In one year, you've read the Bible, the whole Bible. It takes about 15 minutes a day. Anyway, my morning read then, the answer was in there for my night before objections. <laughs> Three days in a row, my morning read, there, there was, there was the answer. There was God overcoming my objections. So God speaks to us through the word and the still small voice. Sometimes we know what God's will is. We know what it is, but we resist doing it. In our own mind, it seems that's too hard. I can't do that. Sometimes what God wants us to do is out of our comfort zone. Noah was out of his comfort zone when he built something that had never been built before. You know, they picture that Noah's ark is a big boat, but, but an ark is a box. I don't think it was shaped like a boat. It doesn't say. But an ark is a box. So I think it was more of a box than it was. I don't think it was made for navigation. The reason the boat is shaped the way it is is because of navigation. But it didn't have sails. It didn't have any navigational propelling mechanism. It just had to float until the waters receded. So I think it was just a box, personally. But he was out, out of his comfort zone. But he believed God. And he stayed with the task even though he was surrounded by evil, violent people. The earth was filled with violence at that time. Abram was out of his comfort zone when he left his own country and his culture. Moses was out of his comfort zone. When God called him out of a burning bush, he made excuses like I did. I can't do that. David was out of his comfort zone when he faced Goliath. He had never faced a man before, especially not a giant. He dispatched a bear and a lion. Carol and I were on our way into Giant Eagle the other day in the store. There was a young lady there that I had seen working in that store in different places, stalking stuff, etc. And she was sitting, they have a greeter there, she was sitting in a chair as a greeter, and she had a big sock it was obviously over a bandage because that foot was bigger than the other one I went right over to her and I was tempted to just say hello but my comfort zone would have been not saying anything but God said in the still small voice pray for her so I dropped you know so, so I, I went up to her and I said what did you do <laughs> What did you do? Like that. And she said she had dropped a U-bolt or something off of a pallet that she was moving and pulling stuff in the store and it injured her foot. So I asked her if I could pray for her. And she said, sure. So we prayed for her. Just because I'm a minister doesn't mean I don't get comfort zoneitis, but that's what we should do, you know? God said, pray for that girl. Someone over, pray for her. 
That doesn't seem a comforting. It was comforting to her. I don't know if she was a believer or not. God let me, God let me awake out of it after I prayed for her. But, you know, you have to sort of be ready for God to speak to you about something like that. And me, I'm ready, you know. And you should be ready. Amen. Amen. Number seven, we have an opponent. <laughs> Satan didn't want Abram to stay in Canaan. When he gave in the pressure from his wife and the rest of his entourage, when they said, do something, we have to get out of here, there's a famine. When he gave in to what he thought would be best, the enemy led him to go to Egypt, where God did not call him to go. The enemy didn't want Carol and I to pray for that girl. We're always in between two competing voices. The enemy and what God wants us to do. The Holy Spirit and demons. Practice hearing from God. Take practice in being, doing that all the time. It takes practice. Practice. The still, small voice. Just listen. Practice making sure that you're hearing in and that what you're hearing is verified in the Word. Try to read the Bible. The whole Bible in a year. And use the devotionals that we have. Number eight, act on the leading of the Spirit and be ready. James 1, 22 to 25. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Not only blessed by what they do, but in what they do, meaning other people will be blessed by you. By you. You're, you're an agent of the Holy Spirit. We all are. We just have to do it. How about today? This is this is this is for today. Second Timothy chapter four. Two to five. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Now that was written to Timothy, who was a young minister, and it said this correct uh, rebuke and courage. That was for him as a young minister and possibly a pastor at that point. But we can all, we can all take um, this part where it says preaching the instant in season and out of season. Verse 3, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. We're in that time. It's here. Instead, suit their own desires. They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. That's what's going on. It's been going on, but it's really prominent now. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Even though that was written to a minister, uh, we can glean a lot of things out of there for everyone, for our, for our own, for our own uh, life. Abraham didn't stray from God's will on purpose. He didn't say, well, that's what God said, I'm not going to do that. His problem was that he was distracted from his diligence in faithful obedience. We have to have a diligence about our obedience to God. He was distracted from that. He went his own way because of the pressure. Instead of going God's way, he just went that way for a moment. We all need to be diligent 
in making every decision in life so that we're always going God's way instead of the world's way or instead of our own way or instead of I got a better idea. Amen? Amen. 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 We gotta go God's way. That's that's your thought for a day. Stay in God, stay in His way. And if you get another idea, check it out in the Word and check it out with God and listen to the still small voice. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you stand. Amen. I'm done preaching now. You can stand. <laughs> Dear Lord, thank you for this family. Thank you for this great Lord. And for the opportunity just to get together. It's always just a wonderful thing just to get together with people that we love each other. We thank you, Lord, that this is not a contentious church. It's not a church of dissenters, but a church with a heart after God and people love each other. And we thank you, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you keep us all safe in the storm that's coming, uh, that we don't overdo it, try to clear the snow, Lord. We ask you just to keep us all safe in that. And um, bring us all back safely, Lord, with some more people, some new people.